So about five years ago, I was um, kind of burned out. I was burned out of doing the, the tech startup thing. Um, I needed a break. And I went to the library looking for a, kind of a fluff book. Like I just needed to, needed to really zone out. And, um, and, I, and I saw one that caught my eye. I think they'd like set it up on the corner of the bookshelf or something. And it was the, the Brothers Karamazov. <laughs> and I, I took it, and it shows how much I knew about literature at the time. I'm like this, you know. Um, it, was, it was not a fluff book. And, uh, and uh, early, early on in the book, um, there's this scene where uh, a woman goes to uh, the elder monk Zosima. And this woman is really distraught. She lives in a very religious time. There's not really much separation of church and state going on there. And she is so guilty. She feels so guilty because she doesn't believe in God or believe in heaven. And, and she's just in anguish over this because it's unacceptable to not believe these things at the time. And so she goes to the monk Zosima to ask what to do. And and Zosima tells her, he says, um, well, there's no way to prove it, but it's enough to be convinced. And if you want to be convinced, then love actively and tirelessly. Love your neighbor, love your friends, love your enemies actively and tirelessly. And the, to the extent that you succeed, you will encounter the timelessness of your soul and of the human spirit. And this really blew me away because it was the first time I'd ever been exposed to the idea that if you have a question surrounding spirituality or religion, you didn't need to just defer to a holy book or something that told you what you had to believe. You could go do an experiment. It, was, it really opened the door for me right there. You could go do an experiment to deepen your spiritual convictions. I was so um, floored by this that I, I wondered, has anybody done it? Like, is anybody out there just loving actively and tirelessly? Um, and I think I, when I say I went searching for them, I think I like brought up Google and typed in like active love or something. Like, who's, who's doing this, you know? And one of the first things that came up was, was a man named Jean Vanier. And uh, Jean Vanier was a French Canadian philosopher. Um, he, in his mid 20s, I believe, decided he too would do an experiment. And he went down to the local insane asylum. And I think that's a picture of him and, and Mother Teresa, by the way. They were good friends. He went down to the insane asylum in his town. And he observed what was going on there. And what he saw were, were people drugged up, milling about in circles. Um, and 50, 60 years ago, we actually didn't distinguish at all between mental illness and handicaps or disabilities. There were quite simply just 50 years ago, people in insane and silence because they had Down syndrome and so on and so forth. We don't like to think we were so primitive such a short time ago, but it's a good reminder. It's a good, good humbling fact. And so he checked out a couple of these guys and he said, they're gonna come live with me. And they just had dinner together and, and, and they had friendship and they, eventually these guys were doing the dishes and sitting on the front porch smiling and waving at people and mowing the lawn. And, and, and so he realized these people weren't crazy, they just didn't have friendship. And you could take any of us and shave our head and give us some pills and deprive us of all friendship and other human needs. And we would be mistaken for crazy before too long. So I um, was so just floored by this man. He had all these insights like, like no matter how disabled a person is, they can tell 
whether you're there because you're forced to be there with them, whether you're paid to be there with them, or whether you want to be there with them. And so he created communities. There's now over 150 of them in the world. One of them being one hour from our very location here in New Zealand. I just found that out today. Of people who would choose to be with the lowest, the non-upward mobile of our society. They were going to choose to be with them out of love. So I went around telling everybody about this man. I was just so inspired. And nobody had ever mentioned him to, had ever heard of them. I was going on and on, active love and this and that, and he's doing it. He's actually doing it. And one friend I told said, yeah, and he'll be here next week. And I said, you know, you got the wrong guy. This guy's like 80. He lives in a little village in France. Um, and he says, no, I, I know the guy. He's, he's bring, being brought into the, the local university by the divinity school there. He'll be here next week. So <laughs> you can bet I was there next week. And, um, and uh, there were a lot of interesting people there. There were a lot of people. People brought <laughs> all the disabled out, all the handicapped, who are actually all around us, but they're just sitting inside watching TV right now. Probably just a few doors down somewhere. And um, I was, and, and, and so to just be around people who are just a little different than, than normal. I was standing in line at uh, the cafe for lunch, and uh, I heard somebody mumble, they have a copy of the Pentateuch in the bookstore in Hebrew. And I, I look around, like, who is talking to me? And I turn around, there's a little girl. She's probably nine or ten. And she wasn't talking to me, necessarily. I don't know who she was talking to, but I'd noticed her. She had walked around the entire time over this two-day conference, staring at the floor and shuffling her feet. Um, I don't even know what you call that special need. I used to know it. Um, Severely autistic, maybe, something like that. And, and anyways, during the intermission, during the time that we were giving this poor 80-year-old you know, Jean Vanier a break from, from delivering all this wisdom to us, he's just sitting there, and we all, people kind of line up because they want to they meet this man, they want to talk to this man. And I'm there in line, I'm about five people back from getting my chance to talk to, to Jean. And... And I can see him, I'm watching him so intently because I'm trying to like plan like well, what, you know, I'm gonna explode with all the things I wanna ask this man and talk to this man about and I have probably 30 seconds. And, uh, and I can see him making eye contact with the people right in front of him, whoever, whoever he's talking to. They're saying, oh, Mr. Vanier, it's so nice you're here and I've loved your work and he's nodding and smiling. And without breaking eye contact, I swear, he reaches his hand out, just out into nothing as he's without breaking eye contact with these people. And that little shuffling girl comes out of nowhere, comes up, takes his hand. And while he's having this conversation with <laughs> whatever adult is heaping all his adulation on him, his arm is, is pulsing every now and then. It's shaking. And, and the girl never looks up. She never looks up. And then after a while, after a minute or so, he, he lets go and she does an about face and shuffles off. And I'm, th I'm thinking, they just had a conversation. They just, they just spoke to each other. So I get up there, and it's, it's finally my turn. And, um, and, and Jean Vanier looks at me, and his face just lifts, and, and he says, it, and he takes both hands, and he says, it's so nice to meet you, and he starts listening. And, in that moment, I feel better than maybe I've ever felt before in my whole life. And, um, and in this moment of feeling this way, actually, a photographer from the local newspaper snaps a picture and it's on the front page the next day. Imagine finding me three weeks earlier and saying, yes, you found somebody, he'll be here couple of weeks and you're going to be on the front page with them in the paper, but it's just, it's just, you can't make this stuff up. So, so I walk away from that conversation and, and several, several friends and I had gone together and we're all just bawling in the back just from saying hello to this man and, <laughs> and hugging each other and crying. And, and, um, 
And I started asking myself, like, where did he get this power? What was that power? And, and he had mentioned it a little in his talk that what he, what he, all he wants to convey to these people that he works with is that they're loved, that they're safe, and that they're someone. And, and so the way he's gotten this power is, is not by just sitting on top of a mountain meditating or going to a to a, a guru or something, this man has spent 40 years at least of his life changing the diapers on adults, um, trying to convince somebody who can't see or speak or hear, just a human spirit stuck in a lump of flesh. He's going to convince them, it's time to get in the bath, we're going to take your clothes off, you're safe, you're someone, you're loved. 40, 50 years of conveying that to people who can't see you, who don't understand the words you're using. That's how he developed that power. So it was with some dismay, you know, as an aspiring wizard that I said, okay, that's what you got to do. You got to go work with these people, apparently. So I found one of these communities and I began to volunteer. And the the first thing you notice when you get to these communities is you immediately start categorizing who's normal and who's handicapped. Because it, it's going to affect what you do, how you talk to them, whether you talk to them, and so on and so forth, right? And so you're constantly putting people in that category. Are you one of us? Are you normal? Or are you one of them? And if you're one of them, I might go up to you and say, well, hello there. How are you today? You know, my name's Josh, right? And I did that. I, you know, I did that once. I saw a guy went up and I said, my name's Josh. And he looks at me and he says, uh, well, that's cool. Like, I'm Bob. Um, glad to have you here, you know? Uh, I'm one of the staff members. And I'm like, oh, he was just having a bad hair day. Like, he hadn't, he hadn't, you know, his hair was like sticking up back here. And so I just assumed, you know, he wasn't. He was disabled, right? And you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, cool, man. Yeah, first day here. And, so, um, eventually though, you stop doing that. It's the strangest thing, but you stop doing that. Because they teach you that everyone is disabled. I didn't know exactly what they meant by that, but as I worked with them, um, I would just, when I say worked with them, I mean just endured them, really. I just sat there, you know, and tried to make small talk with them or something. And, and what I mean by um, all of us are disabled is that as I sat there, when these people were happy, they were happy. You knew it. If they were happy, they might be clapping and smiling, and, and they're, they're happy. And if they were angry, was no passive aggressiveness. They threw the slice of pizza at you. And, and at first you're just like, what, you know? And then later on you're thinking, I'm not that free. Like, like I, I should be happy right now. Like, why am I not clapping? Why, you know, is it okay to clap? All right. You know, but Pierre over here isn't waiting for permission to clap. He's happy, you know? And, um, and Margaret over there, she's, she's mad. I'm mad too, but you can't tell because I've buried it. I've got all this surplus intelligence that I use to create this artifice over my whole, my whole being. And that was my disability. I wasn't as free as these people were. The other thing that happens uh, is that you start to wonder if maybe you're okay. Because this, isn't, this, isn't a, this is a very humiliating road to, or humbling road to enlightenment here, or, or self-acceptance, but the thought process is really this. Um, you know, Pierre over there is drooling on himself right now. And I think he just farted. And he moans when you're not supposed to moan, like when we're supposed to be like listening to something or paying attention. And people are really treating him well anyway. It seems that they love him anyway, right now. 
And this one over here, I think, just peed on themselves, and the diaper is not doing all that it can do. And it's not kicked out. Like, he's not humiliated. And so if, if they're still lovable, and they're drooling on themselves and doing all these unacceptable things, like, I'm, I've got to be okay, because I've got it together, you know? Like, I've got to... And that's, that's the humble road to self-acceptance when you're there. It's maybe I'm okay because that guy, I wasn't sure if he was okay. And he it seems like he's okay. People, people love him anyway. Maybe I'm lovable too. And eventually you say, of course, I've got to be lovable if they are. And so you go and they tell you you're going to go to these communities and you always go thinking you're going to help them. And of course, if you're just there for a week or a couple of days, you're just going to get in the way. They know that. They'll give you little things. Well, can you wheel so-and-so down the hall for us? Okay. And, and you walk out of there and you realize that you were the one who was helped. They helped you. So I uh, was years later feeling the travel itch, wondering where to go, looking at the map kind of aimlessly. A lot of places I've never been. How do you decide? And a friend says to me, why don't you go see Jean Vanier? And my heart just lifted, and it's like, can, you just, can I just do that? Can I go see him? And so I flew to France, and I, flew to this, I, I took a train to this little town that I still can't pronounce outside of, outside of France, outside of Paris, rather. And uh, I spent time there in the original community. And there were other people there, people my age, people younger, people older. And I started asking them, like, why are you here? Why, like, why, you know, you're doing this with your time, you know? You're a good-looking guy. You could be, like, out there, you know, like, with normal people, like, like doing stuff. And he's here. And, he said, and this one guy said to me, I'll never forget, he says, well, I'm sure there's a power here that can change the world. There are 150 of these communities today all around the world that are changing the world with that power. And like I said, there's one here in New Zealand an hour away. And I want you to think now here about the Aroha Valley and why is everyone here so amazing? Why is every conversation you have here one of the best conversations you've had? Why are you more amazing than you were back home. <laughs> and I think it's the same power that L'Arche has. The name of these communities that John Vanier started called L'Arche, means the Ark in French. And first and foremost, I think what L'Arche is, and in my opinion what this place is, which I never counted on, is that it's a safe place. It is a safe place to be yourself, to be your fullest self, to be a self you've never even dreamed of being. And I'm just really grateful that the founding team here, first and foremost, got that right. Thank you. Thank you. You answered my question. And, um, just, yeah, I lost my dad to cancer. And um, I loved him like that, you know? <laughs> and I just know that that's how I am with people. And that's enough. <laughs> I know this. Actually, that's the only thing that can really change the world. <sighs> I love you. Um, thank you so much, Josh. That was really fantastic. And um, really speaks to my heart and I think the work that I have in the world, too. And um, it reminded me of, did any of you all see that there was an article on Huffington Post recently about addiction and the causes of addiction, right? And so a bunch of you know this and that. So the original study that was done was 
by the Partnership for a Drug-Free America, which you know, probably most of us know is more about politics than it is about helping people, um, said, oh, if we put a rat in a cage and there's a water bottle with normal water and there's a water bottle with cocaine water, that rat is going to go to the cocaine water until it kills himself. And so that was the propaganda that was used to convince many children and humans that drugs are bad and you should never do them ever because you will die. And so then in the 1970s, um, a professor from Vancouver was like, well, I mean, if I was in a cage by myself, like, I probably might kill myself too. So he made this, like, rat palace. And he had this cage with, like, all these rats together, and they had toys and activities, and they, they lived in community. And then again, he put the water bottle with normal water, cocaine water in the rat palace. And guess what? None of the rats killed themselves. Some of them went to the cocaine water every once in a while. I think it was like 10%. Um, but none of them died, and they didn't. the ones that went to the cocaine water did not do it like habitually in a way that was detrimental to their health at all. And not only that, he then took rats who had been isolated in a cage, who had been addicted to the cocaine water. They hadn't you know, killed themselves, but they were in the space of going back over and over and over again, and put them in the rat palace. They stopped drinking the cocaine water. So I just I think you know we have this um, idea sometimes that we're not we're not all the same. We don't have disabilities. Oh, we were like you're saying you know we classify. Oh, this person is this way. This person is this other way. And um, yeah, I don't really. I guess I don't really have anything else to say. I just want to share that story because it's so reminiscent. And um, yeah, that's really that's really powerful. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Uh, I've worked with a lot of disabled children in my teaching career, and I've often thought, yes, they do teach you more than you are teaching them. And almost at some level, they're doing it too. They're, they're getting their needs met. I don't know. It's kind of like uh, it, it, different things happen to ensure um, that they get love. Um, but I loved your thing about people being able to sense whether they're getting paid yeah. or whether they care, because people need to be reminded of that in, in, in many settings, too, with health care. Uh, a lot of people in hospitals and nursing homes that are being cared for by strangers, and that's equally sad. Yeah. yeah. It's back, back the same sort of uh, spin off on the same theme that I'm recycling. It's the basis of humanity, right? that we're really mammals, we're chimpanzees, bonobos, and the way they deal with stress is that they come and they touch each other, and they hold each other. And if one chimp you know, was almost killed by some tiger out there, it comes back and it's being held by the tribe. So the, whole, the nervous system of the whole tribe is regulating this one individual who's been completely dysregulated, right? which is normal. We all get dysregulated. The, the, what, what this Jean was doing was regulating you to a whole new way of, of tuning. He was tuning your instrument to a different octave of love. You know, and so, and these guys were showing you where your def defense structures were. And when you're in, you know, when you see these defense structures, you, they just fall away. They really do. If, if you're held. If you're held and supported and you're not in fear and you're not in hunger, you're not in survival. And the reason that this is working is because we are all kind of thriving individuals. You know, we have a certain either age limit, I mean age group or uh, financial status, which is thank God so we can be actually creative and innovative. And that's how all the cultures have done it. You know, it's, it's when it's been peace. You know, and so how do we regulate these other people who are at war? who are still running the defense structures, we hold them. It's, it's that safety, it's that love. And so it's, it's through nervous system regulation. It's actually much simpler, and it's, we're using uh, psychology. So Maya has mentioned Rat Palace three times in the past you know, week. It's, it keeps coming up. And I was going to joke and just start saying it all, it's, all, it's all about Rat Palace. You know, like, and um, one of the reasons it came up is because I was talking to some people, and we, we found that we weren't spending very much time on our computers, and it was weird because like, we had them, and we've got Wi-Fi everywhere. And 
I can't spend more than like 15 minutes on my computer here and I'm just like, there's nothing for me here. And I shut it and I, I want to go out and have a conversation with somebody, right? Or go look at some artwork or, you know, whatever. And, and it's, it's, it's like Rat Palace. And what does it say about our usual <laughs> homes, you know? Well, we can go five hours, eight hours, 10 hours on the computer in a day and still, still keep going back. I haven't had enough. There's, there's got to be more for me in here, right? It's, <laughs> it's, it's uh, challenging. So. There's definitely a, a core intention, you know, when we talk about different people bringing their unique gifts, you know, that's been a, a set of vocabulary that we've been kind of coming back to a lot. And, you know, the, in our current society, it's so regimented, you know, the sort of California culture. Um, it's, it's like, you know, Josh was talking about there's all these people who live amongst us in community and who we never see and they're just totally alienated and disenfranchised so definitely yes uh, an intention to integrate all forms and all populations um you know this sort of um developmentally impaired or physically impaired has probably been one that hasn't had a lot of conversation you know we've thought a lot about um sort of the indigenous community of new zealand we've thought a lot about different age Accurate and, and how that sort of fits in, but um, I can't recall any explicit conversations. And yet, uh, immediately when you say that, I, I recognize that um, this space would be really good for that. Being out in nature and, and ha holding that space, you know, is, is really cool. So maybe that's something that we could even explore because I know you have some background in wilderness therapy and, and the like, and maybe you could even help point us in the right direction on some of this. Cool. It's tangentially related, but I wanted to share an intention that has emerged explicitly around uh, how we share out some of the learnings and models, especially as it relates to uh, sustainability, technology, and uh, practices around food and shelter and so forth, um, which is to really focus on the least socially uh, upward mobile, so to speak, um, and, uh, and since we're talking a lot about kind of the notion of climate change, it's often displaced populations um, who are adversely affected by climate who may not have access to many resources. So um, a lot of the thought that, for instance, Brian's done around the materials we source are things like, uh, what can we find that's in dramatic abundance that's not being recognized as valuable? Shipping pallets. Uh, there's like, what, two billion of them or a billion of them on the planet, and most of them are being unused or used only for one purpose, one-time use. Um, so we're cutting down trees to ship our stuff, and then we're um, wasting it. And so, um, or recycled billboards. So you see, like, the yurts and a lot of the beds and different things like this, they're made from these types of materials with the notion that if we can then also add the, the video and document level, um, that we can uh, hopefully help distribute patterns, specifications, how-to uh, types of content out there um, specifically to uh, enable and empower with these types of tools uh, the things that we're learning here. And also just kind of continue to reground our experience of this because we're trying to keep that fine balance between um, kind of luxury and nature so that we can have an experience where we feel healed, we feel held, we feel taken care of, and can really expand and give our greatest gifts and talents, but at the same time not lose that deep groundedness of what are, what are we doing it for and where uh, we really need to stay grounded in order to uh, be of service to the world. And so I think it's part of that. It's a natural conversation to really think about how we um, integrate more around mentally handicapped or uh, disabled individuals. I'm really glad you're calling that in. I just wanted to, to thank you, Josh, for the way that you showed up here today and, and have showed up every day that you've been here. Yeah, it's been really rad, so I'll just leave it at that. My closing thought is that just I'm always so I'm always so happy when um, 
in these environments, someone just comes and delivers the message of love in, in just such a relatable, just, just a beautiful, relatable, dropped-in way. And I feel like that's, like, every single person here gets to have their life a little bit changed and enhanced when we share from that place. So thank you for just dropping into something that you care so deeply about that, that truly on some level or another affects each one of us.